Your affliction has nothing to do with nobody else. You're just going through some stuff. I know y'all here cute on Easter Sunday. I know y'all that got dressed up. Your face is beat. Ain't that what y'all say? Y'all know y'all got it all good. Your drip is magnified and you feeling real good. But some of us, if we could be honest, we look good from afar, but we far from looking good. Come on. You got to recognize that you came in here while everybody else was praising. You was thinking about your pain. Other people lifted their hands and you say, God, I'm still hurting. And while other people seem to get their breakthrough, you felt like God missed you. Have you ever been in church, ever been in a season of life? It seemed like everybody getting what you wish that you had and they were getting what they didn't even ask for. Why they got joy? They don't even like you anyway, God. Why they got peace? They trouble anyway. And sometimes you got to ask God, God, consider my affliction. We have been in a sermon series covering Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible, uh, and it is broken down in stanzas of eight, eight verses, and each stanza is headlined by a Hebrew alphabet, and we've been going through Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a psalm that's all about devotion and dedication and determination to obey the word of God. You hear this desperation in the psalmist throughout it, and as he cries out, he's believing that God will hear him. And also, as we are in our theme this year, our 2024 big banner word is deeper. Everybody say deeper. Yeah. And so we're hoping that this series has taken us deeper. And I believe that while this is on Resurrection Sunday, we believe Jesus is the word. And we believe that this psalm is going to help us see how Jesus delivers his word to us, for us, and through us. Amen? So we're going to be in Psalm 119, starting at verse 153 uh, and going through verse 160. Psalm 119, starting at verse 153 through verse 160. We'll be reading in the New King James Version. You know participation is better than what? I know you've been standing for an elongated time. Just stand with me just for eight verses real quick. And we're going to stand in honor and the reading of the God's Word. The next time you stand up, it could be when you get excited during the sermon. You can get excited during the sermon. Raise your hands. You can take a lap. You can take off running. Just be agile and mobile. Uh, Psalm 119, starting at verse 153. Let us read together. Consider my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. Many are my persecutors and my enemies, yet I do not turn from your testimonies. I see the treacherous and am disgusted because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. I'm going to go back to verse 153, and this is where I find my focal today. It says, consider my affliction... And do what? Deliver me. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know about you, but I need deliverance. Look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, I got good news for you. Delivery is guaranteed. Amen. That's my title, topic, subject, and focus. Come on. Delivery guaranteed. You may be seated. It is my hope as we explore Psalm 119 through the lens of the gospel that we will see that Jesus, he relates and rescues us. Jesus, he represents and redeems us. Jesus, he resources and revives us. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this time as we open up your word. I believe our hearts and our minds are already open to receive what it is you have for us. But God, I pray that we will be able to lock in, that you will speak to us, Holy Spirit, that you will give us insight beyond what Chris can say. I pray, Lord, that you will speak to people according to what they need today, where they need strength, where they need healing, where they need big breakthrough, where they need direction. God, speak to them. I pray now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Delivery guaranteed. As I think about this idea of delivery guaranteed, I don't know how many of you all have been shopping online, and when you see the delivery, 
estimated delivery date, that determines if you get the item or not. Some of us who are avid online shoppers, I'm not going to call anybody out. I'm just going to look at you. <laughs> we get excited when we see it'll be there in two days. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's like, have you ever realized how the idea of expectations of a gift went from pretty wrapping paper to brown paper with a little arrow? In a... Y'all, if y'all, y'all don't know about it yet. Amazon Prime has changed the game. It changed the game because once they start guaranteeing delivery, oh, people start getting stuff that even they didn't even need. Just because you can get it there in two days. You can order it in your pajamas. You can order it, but it's going to come there. It's going to be right at your front door. You ever think about when you go into the holiday season, some of us, we have tested Amazon at their guarantee. Amazon has a delivery guarantee. It says we offer guaranteed delivery on certain delivery speeds and select products. We guarantee delivery is available on an order and we'll state, on this, we'll state this on the checkout page with the associated delivery date and cost. And then they said, but if you got Amazon Prime, it's free. Come on, y'all. y'all. I just need a few people that know what I'm talking about. Maybe... Maybe it's Walmart Plus for you. Maybe, may, maybe it's something else. But, but y'all understand that when you see free shipping and it's going to be here in two days, doesn't it make the outfit look better? Doesn't it make the gadget more needed? Doesn't it make the present just that much sweeter? That it's going to be there in two days. Now, sometimes they even expedite it a little bit. They say if you order in a certain time, it'll be here tomorrow. And given your locale, you might get same-day delivery. Some of us, we get really excited about it. Some of us have built a keen relationship with the delivery person. You see them, and you look at them like they're old friends. They hop out that blue van or that white van with the, with the FedEx on the side, and you start looking at them like, hey, buddy, how you doing, man? Been, you got there with your robe on and your, co- and your coffee? Good to see you. Yeah, how, th- how your mama doing? Uh-huh. You start building a relationship because what it is, you appreciate their effort to get something to you in a timely fashion. And some of us have tested this in the holiday season. Come on, how many of y'all, you finally found the gift, but you're like, man, I hope it get here on time. You ain't never prayed for a delivery like you prayed for that one. <laughs> Come on, and when it get there, I hate it when it's a day late. It don't look as good when it's a day late. But as I think about this thing, what, what I realize is you might be in your jammies and you might just push a button, but when you push a button, there's other things that happen to, in order to guarantee what you just asked for. When you push the button, it goes through a system and that system pops up into a warehouse and then there's a delivery or either an order filling team and they begin to get your package all together and put it in the right place and make sure the address is right. And then they move it in a timely fashion through the warehouse on the conveyor belt into the back of a, in, into the back of a delivery vehicle. And then we often only celebrate the one who delivered it. But what you forget is that there was a process to your product. And today we're celebrating, yes, the one who delivered us, but we're also going to celebrate his process as well. When I think about delivery guaranteed, as I come to this Resurrection Sunday, I am am encouraged to know that through Christ, we we have guaranteed deliverance. We have deliverance from bondage and deliverance to freedom. We have deliverance of joy and peace and deliverance of salvation. Is there anybody in here glad with expectation that in Christ, that delivery is guaranteed? As I look at Psalm 153, if I could metaphorically put the psalmist in a place where he's trying to get an order through, or should I say in a more spiritual term, he's trying to get a prayer through. And what I like about the psalms is that they don't always tell you the situation that the person was in. But what we do see is that we see that this is a cry for help. This is a cry for deliverance. And although I don't know the situation he's in, but what I realize is that psalms is filled with real people with real problems in search of a real God. And I just want to know, is there anybody in here that's a real person that got some real problems that need a real God to show up for you? And I look at Psalm 119, 153, I see it. He says, consider my affliction 
and deliver me. Consider my affliction and deliver me. This specific stanza of Psalm 119, this specific stanza of Psalm 119 starts with the Hebrew letter where we get our letter R from. It is resh. And so we see the Hebrew letter R is now the one that kicks us off. And so I thought that it was, I thought that it was fitting that a lot of what we're looking for in this psalm starts with the letter R. And we'll see in this that Jesus, he relates with us. We'll see Jesus Jesus rescues us. We'll see Jesus redeems us. We'll see Jesus resources us and Jesus revives us because it all starts right there that he's saying, I'm going to guarantee that what I said would happen. It will happen. I'm going to guarantee that my word will accomplish what I said. It will accomplish and you will get your relation. You will get your rescue. You will get your redemption and your revival when you trust in the Lord. By viewing this by viewing this psalm through the Easter story, uh, my first point is that Jesus relates and rescues me. He relates with me and he rescues me. Uh, psalm 119, 153. Consider my affliction and deliver me. I like the prayers that I find in Psalms. He says, Lord, I got some stuff going on. And I know you got a lot. But if you could for a moment, consider my affliction. Now listen, I'm not promoting a selfish religion or a selfish theology, but what I am saying is God needs to hear your cry. He needs to hear your voice. He says, Lord, just consider. He's saying, will you listen to me for a moment? Will you hear my affliction? And now I understand this, that affliction, pain, suffering, they, they are the most common language amongst our human, our human experience. Affliction, pain, and suffering is the most common language in our human experience. In other words, affliction, which is what we're saying is felt pain. Affliction, sometimes you don't even see what's causing the pain. You just feel it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You don't have a, you know, you see a splinter in your finger, you know what's causing it. But what happens when you just got a pain in your soul? You afflicted. I know people say, um, the sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie. Because sometimes it's people's words that are hurt you and you have an affliction in your soul. People can't see the words that hit you, but you feel the words that hit you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Affliction is that felt pain. It's deep down on the inside. It's, 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 it's physical. It's emotional. It's mental. It's relational. And he says, consider my affliction. Consider it, Lord. Just pay attention to it. And when I think about this moment, because we don't know the exact situation, as we read throughout Psalm um, 119, 153 through 160, uh, we can suggest that he has some treacherous uh, conniving enemy type people around him. Uh, now, if you sit beside that person right now, don't look at them too hard. Uh, but sometimes the people around us cause us affliction and sometimes it's unintended. Uh, sometimes I like to know if somebody planning to cause me pain. At least I know how to take it. But it's the pain that I won't plan on having. Some of us, you have enemies that is outside of you. Some of us, some of us have enemies that are around us. But some of, some of us have enemies that are our enemies within us. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, your affliction has nothing to do with nobody else. You're just going through some stuff. I know y'all here cute on Easter Sunday. I know y'all that got dressed up, your face is beat, ain't that what y'all say? Y'all know y'all got it all good, your drip is magnified, and you feeling real good, but some of us, if we could be honest, we look good from afar, but we far from looking good. Come on, you got to recognize that you came in here while everybody else was praising, you was thinking about your pain. Other people lifted their hands, and you say, God, I'm still hurting, and while other people seem to get their breakthrough, you felt like God missed you. Have you ever been in church, ever been in a season of life? It seemed like everybody getting what you wish that you had and they were getting what they didn't even ask for. Why they got joy? They don't even like you anyway, God. Why they got peace? They trouble anyway. And sometimes you got to ask God, God, consider my affliction. Some of us came here this Sunday and you had to be honest because you wanted to put on face, but now I'm going to give you the space to be, to be real with you and God. You're a real person. Real problems in search of a real God. Here's what I realized uh, before I get to delivery guarantee because I know we're going to shout and be excited about that. Let me tell you, and this is some real news. It might not be good. It might be bad, but it's real. 
Affliction is guaranteed. That's what I realized. Affliction is guaranteed. Matter of fact, here's what Psalm 34, 19 said. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Yep, many are the afflictions of the righteous. This means if you subscribe to Christianity because you thought it was going to get you out of trouble, you got the wrong one. In other words, if you thought, oh, I'm going to church now, nothing bad will happen, you got the wrong one. Let me tell you what's guaranteed. It's the righteous that get tested, yes. And let me tell you what's guaranteed. As soon as you try to do right, you're going to feel all the wrong. I need about five people to go ahead and testify. You know what I'm talking about. Many are the afflictions of the right. I don't like how the word many doesn't have a specific number to it. I will, I, will, I will want to count down my afflictions. I want God to say, Chris, I have allotted you 15. Because when I get to 13, I'm like, God, I think I can make it. But when you get to many, you could be in 20. You're like, God, I don't know how much more I got left. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but that's not where the, that's not where the, where the scripture stops. But the Lord delivers them, <laughs> delivers him out of them all. Come on. See, that's what I like, the conjunction, conjunction, what's your function? But God, but the Lord delivers them all. Affliction is guaranteed, but understand your problems are, your problems have to have permission from God to be in your life. Your problems, your accuser, even Satan, has to have permission from God to be in your life. Your problems, your enemies are unwilling participants in God's ultimate sovereign will. In other words, they might not know it, but God going to use them to get you closer to him. And so this is why the Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. See, I like, I want some particulars. You said various. Various trials and tribulations. This means it can come in a multitude of ways. I don't know if you've ever been in a season of various, various trials and tribulations, various issues, and the people that you thought was going to be with you, they, laid, they lied to you, laid with you, and then left you. Various. Y'all got to know what I'm talking about. Like your money got funny, and you had bills that were due, but then your bank account was empty. Various trials and tribulations. As soon as you finally got your finances right, then your health got wrong. Various trials and tribulations. Finally, you get along with your kids, but now you and your spouse don't get along. Various trials and tribulations. I'm not talking to anybody in here. Various trials and tribulations. But he said, count it all joy. <laughs> God, I, I, I don't disagree with you. I don't always understand it. Because for me, when I think about joy, I think about long walks on the beach with my bride. Perfect breeze, about 69 degrees. Right? And I, and I no, no, no seashells. I don't want smooth Hawaiian sand. When I think about Joe, I think about cinnamon buns that, that are warm and the calories don't translate to tomorrow. When I, y'all gonna, when I think about joy, I think about those types of things. But he told me that when I'm in trouble, that's when I need to think about joy. See, in my, in my natural mind, I'm like, God, you tripping. But in my renewed mind, I understand that my trials and my tribulations are working for me, not against me. They didn't come to destroy me. They came to develop me. And affliction is a part of your right as your righteousness in Christ. And what he does is he uses affliction to help you see who he is that he's faithful to his word. Some of us are only Old Testament believers or some of us don't believe the New Testament and the Old Testament connect. And so Psalm 34, 19 said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. So Jesus then said in John 16, 33, he says, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Y'all see, we are constantly, our human experience is a sandwich between, divi between divinity, our existence, and problems. Y'all see it? And some of y'all thought it was just you. No. That's your human experience. You are sandwiched between God and a broken world. When sin entered into the world, the gift of sin to us was affliction. Affliction in our soul, affliction in our existence, affliction in our relationships, existence everywhere. But what he says is in this world, you will have tribulation. So let's, let's stop being surprised. Matter of fact, you should have peace. Like God, I know the trouble might come, but you told me trouble don't last always. Come on, somebody. I'm so glad that trouble don't last always. I know one I'm trusting in. He says be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. So the first thing I recognize is that the psalmist 
The reasons why he says, consider my affliction, is he recognizes the Lord relates with him. The Lord relates. You know when somebody gets you. You know when you ain't got to say everything. They just understand what you're going through. He says, he said, relate with me. And then not only did he say relate with me, uh, because he's saying, God, I need you to hear me. Uh, that's one thing. God, I need you to hear me. Now, Hebrews will tell us that Jesus is our high priest. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, it says... Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize, or should I say relate with our weaknesses, um, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So I'm telling you, Jesus went through what you're going through, yet he did not sin. So when you're going through, he's the one that can say, I can relate to you. Then he says in verse 16, Hebrews chapter 4, what's the response? Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And so there's two things in this first verse. When he says, consider my afflictions, he's saying, hear me. But then he said, let's go to Psalm 119 verse 153, consider my affliction, hear me, and do what? Deliver me. So he's saying, Lord, relate to me, but God also needs you to rescue me. He's saying, Lord, hear me, but I also need you to help me. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been a part of a conversation and, and somebody really was listening to you. They was listening to the problems you were going through. They was listening to your troubles. And they leaned in to listen to you, but then they couldn't do nothing to help you. At some point, I need to change who I'm talking to. Y'all better be real up in here. Thank you for hearing me. But I need to know, can you help me? Uh, in other words, what he's saying is, Lord, consider my affliction. I, I, I need you to hear me, but Lord, I also, I need you to help me. Is there anybody in here that's willing to admit, God, I came here on this Sunday. I came here on this Resurrection Sunday because I need some help. I need you to help me in a way that my boo thing can't help me. I need you to help me in a way that my job can't help me. I need your help. Somebody shout, I need your help. And so he said, Lord, don't only, don't only just hear me, but I need you to help me as well. I need you to rescue me. And when I get to this idea of help, Psalm 46 verse 1 comes to mind. God is our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in our time of trouble. Psalm 121, 1 through 2, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. What I'm saying is today, family, we are celebrating that because Jesus got out that grave, he is our ever present help. His help didn't stop back then. His help is afresh right now. He is there to help you and his help is not temporary. His help is eternal. His help will keep on helping you as anybody in here can testify that you've seen the Lord help you. You've seen the Lord pick you up. You've seen the Lord turn you around. You've seen him put your feet on solid ground. God I need you to rescue me. I need you to help me. Uh, we almost there. Some of y'all about to get real because some of us know if the Lord don't help you, you're going to end up in a place you can't get yourself out of. Some of us, you are one comment away from losing your mind and you're trying to go back to work on Monday as a sanctified individual. Lord, I need your help. You looking at your spouse. If you disappoint me one more time, I'm out of here. Lord, I need your help. You looking at your children. Say, so you get on my nerves one more time, I'm going to cut you off. But then the Lord says, I didn't cut you off. Lord, I need your help. I don't know who I'm talking to in here, but I believe there's some people in here that said, listen, what I need, Amazon can't do it. What I need, a sale can't do it. What I need, only Jesus can do it. I need your help. So what I recognize, the Lord, he relates to us. Uh, the Lord, he rescues us. And that's just the first verse, y'all. He says, he says, for, he says, I don't forget your law. See, this is why we're doing the 40-day word challenge, because we need people to be reminded outside of Sunday that the Lord is still with them. I need you to know on Wednesday, when it's hump day, it's still his help day. Come on. I need you to know that he is there with you. He's Emmanuel, God with you. I need you to be in your word, because when well, you don't forget the law, you don't forget the one who wrote it. You don't forget the one who, who fulfills it. You don't forget the one who guarantees it. And so somewhere along the line, 
This psalmist was convinced. I, I, wonder, I wonder what convinced him to know that if he calls out to the Lord, the Lord will respond. I wonder what customer reviews did he check on God's word before he sent this order in. I wonder, did he hear about how God provided for Abraham in a foreign land? I wonder, did he hear about how God used Moses, an angry shepherd, to deliver an entire nation out of slavery? I wonder, did he hear about how God provided bread in the wilderness, water from a rock, and made a way out of nowhere? I wonder what he heard that would convince him that God is able to help him. What have you heard? What have you experienced that will remind you that God is able. And so as I look at this moment, God, yes, he relates to me. Yes, he rescues me. But also, he represents and redeems me. He represents and redeems me. I, uh, Psalm 119, verse 154. He said, plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Right there. He said, plead my cause and redeem me. And then 155, he says, salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statues. Now, this messed me up a little bit, because later on, he said, the wicked, they disgust me. And you can see he's writing some battle raps right now. He upset. Oh. And so he's, but, but what he's saying in 155, and what he's saying later on, when he said, oh, many are the persecutors of my enemies, yet I do not turn from your testimonies. I see the treacherous, and I'm disgusted, because they do not keep your word. What he's saying is, salvation is far from those that won't turn to the Lord. Yeah, he's not saying that God won't save to the uttermost. He's just saying that some people have went so far to the uttermost, they don't recognize the utmost. And so he's saying that in this moment, he's like, there are people who don't even look at you. There are people who consider you an option and not a mandated priority. He's saying, God, but I'm holding on to your law. There's a difference in people who want God and the people who need him. Y'all with me? Yeah. There's, there's a difference in people who say, you know what? The man upstairs, the higher power, he's an option. Versus for those who've been knocked flat on their back. And they look up and they say, God, you're the only one that can help me. And he's saying, God, I recognize you are not an option. You are a mandated priority. Uh, can I pull the crowd just for a moment? Is there about 50 people here that don't just want Jesus? But they need him. Like, I need... <laughs> I need Jesus. Y'all gotta, even if I got him, I'm gonna say, I need a little more Jesus. Come on. I need a little more Jesus tomorrow. I need a little bit more Jesus next week. I don't just want him. I need, when you need him, oh, you are in a different place. You're in a place of desperation. And so he said in, in Psalm 150, 119, 154, he said, this is what I want, God. Plead my cause and redeem and redeem me. So the first one, he represents me. He said, please my, plead my cause or either plead my case. This is legal, legal terms now. And he's saying, um, they are bringing charges against me and I need somebody to represent me. Uh, some of us know about the Miranda rights. Some of us know better than others. <laughs> right? But when you get arrested, you got the right to remain silent. Y'all know that part. But this is the part I really want to get to. Said, but anything you say will be used against you. Just... But, but here's what they say. They say, you have the right to a lawyer, and if you cannot afford one, one will be provided for you. In other words, they're saying, what we are detaining you for, you're going to need a representative to help you get out. Yep. <laughs> now, let me tell you, uh, I like how it switched to legal, to legal language here, because in 154, it said, plead my cause. Now we go to a courtroom. As we go to a courtroom, you got to recognize, if we were to put ourselves there, that the charges brought against us were sin. And the fact of the matter is, we are guilty. So here we are, we're in the courtroom, and we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory, and therefore, the, the wages of sin is what? Death. So here it is, we're in court, and the death penalty is staying at us. But now when I read this psalm, and I think about what Jesus did, remember when Jesus, before he got to the cross, they put a case against him, because they tried to change something legally that was spiritually. And so what Jesus did, he played the legal role to upset the law, fulfill the law, that we might not be penalized by the law. Y'all better talk to him. And so then when Jesus sees us in court, he says, listen, I've already been through what they're trying to take you through. Because when he was 
was in court, they slapped him. They beat him. But the word says he didn't say a mumbling word. What he did, he took it in silence that he might be the savior of all. He says, I'm not just here to vindicate me. I'm not here just to represent me. I'm here to represent everybody that came after me. I don't know about you, but I need Jesus to represent me. He intercedes on our behalf with deep moans and groans until the Father, he represents us. You are represented. He represents you in the case. And so here it is. We cannot afford this lawyer. That's what it is. We can't afford this lawyer. Uh, but here's what I like. Here's what I like about it. I heard it in the old school church. I used to hear the church mother say that, you, that he's been a doctor in the sick room. He's been a lawyer in the courtroom. That he is my heart fixer, my mind regulator. That he made a way out of no way. Is there anybody in here on this resurrection Sunday that can say, I'm glad that Jesus represents me? I'm glad that when God looks at me, he don't look at me by my faults. He looked beyond my faults and he sees my knee. I have a representative and his name is Jesus. Woo! To know that Jesus represents you. He knows where you've fallen short. He knows where you made a mistake. And this is what he said. I know all about your problems and my promise outweighs your problems. I love the fact that he has promises that outweigh our problems. I love the fact that his atoning sacrifice on the cross was good for it. It was good then and it's good now. In other words, you ain't got to die again. He already died for you. That's how you get eternal life because death that we formerly knew is no longer an exclamation point. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Now it's a comma. And that's what a comma and now comes a conjunction. But God, and when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, I love the fact that he has mercies that are new every morning. He has grace that is sufficient. That he represents me. He represents me. So it says, Lord, I need you to represent me when I'm persecuted. I need you to represent me when I'm hurting. I need, to I need you to represent me when I'm struggling. I need an advocate. I need somebody to plead my case. Sometimes you can't get the prayers through, but here's the good news. Uh, that Jesus is our high priest. In Hebrews 7, 25, it says, Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And so intercession is another way uh, to say that he interrupts de the devil's plans to release God's plans. So he intercedes, he stands in between. So when the Father looks at you, he looks at you through the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What? can make me whole again. Nothing but the, come on, the blood still has power. It reaches from the highest height. Then it flows to the lowest valley. Come on, does anybody know what I'm talking about? The blood still works. I heard a story just the other day and you're talking about who represents you and who redeems you. Uh, there was a there was an aircraft uh, crash that was it happened in 1987, and, and as soon as the plane took off, um, that it crashed, and they thought everybody had died. And then there was a four-year-old little girl uh, that had survived, and some people started doubting if she actually survived the crash or was she in one of the cars that the plane hit when it crashed. But when they came up to them, they looked at the they looked at the manifest and they saw the little girl's name, and when they saw the little girl's name and they said she was on the plane. The rescuer said when we found her, she had blood on her, but it wasn't hers. And what the story suggests is that the mother took her seatbelt off and wrapped her arms around the daughter. And while the mother was bleeding, but the mother saved the daughter. And let me tell you, we don't have that type of mother, but we have a savior that when they see us after the crash, we might have blood on us, but it ain't your blood. It's the blood that saves you. It's the blood that covers you. Is anybody in here glad that Jesus covers you? He represents you. He redeems you. I'm covered in the blood. I know I ain't perfect, but he is. I'm covered in the blood. I know I still got some stuff, but I'm covered. As I look at this, he redeems me. He said, Lord, represent me, but also redeem me. And so he's saying, Lord, I need some outside help to come and redeem me. Redeem me to the form in which you had planned for me. And I love this idea of redemption. Uh, redemption, uh, it means to restore to right standing. 
It means to buy back from a captor. And he says, Lord, represent me, but also redeem me. I don't know if you've ever been in a place that you started looking at your bank account when it was time to swipe. Come on, we're talking to some people in here. And somebody say, no, 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 no. I got it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Anybody ever help y'all like that? If not, you need to get some better friends. <laughs> Ain't no need for everybody to be broke. You need one. You need one that got a little something. When they say, you know, when certain people suggest restaurants, you got to be like, now, hold on now. You know, you live a little bit different. <laughs> but when somebody else slide that card up there, Have you ever had the joy of somebody paying for you? Come on, somebody paid, somebody paid the bill. Uh, it gives you a sense. Don't it make the food taste better? It makes the experience better. Uh, that somebody paid for it and you, it didn't have to come out your account. And that's what I begin to experience when I think about the redemption of Jesus. Jesus, he, he just paid for it. And so when you wake up in the morning, you take that breath. The bill has already been paid. He, he paid for that. Uh, before I asked for it, the bill was already covered. That's the beauty of redemption. He paid for it. He paid it all. But, but, but here sometimes we think redemption is momentary. Now, when you look at redemption, this is one of those words that translates across multiple tenses. Because you could be redeemed. You could be getting redeemed. Uh, you could just be redeemed. And you could be redeemed. So, is it safe to say that redemption takes in consideration my past, wipes that out, ensures my present, and gives me an inheritance for the future? Mm -hmm. Redemption is like a car, but it needs a driver. And so, the dri understand, you can have a car that's fully equipped, but without a driver, it can't go nowhere. Uh -huh. Redemption is like a car, but it needs a driver. And so what he asked for here, uh, he said, Lord, redeem me. He said, can you get in and take the will? Jesus, take the will. That's what he's saying. Jesus, take the will. And, and here's what I realized, that, that redemption is not just what God does. It is also who he is. Y'all don't believe it? Uh huh. I called up my man Job this morning. I said, Job, I'm preaching on Easter. I said, Can you give me a word? He said, Well, look, when I was down and out, when I was full of grief and relational strife, when I was sick in my body, when my wife was nagging me, y'all ain't gonna talk to me today. He said, When I was down and out, my friends was doubting me, and I wasn't sure where God was. This is what I realized. I know my Redeemer lives. Woo! He said, I know my Redeemer lives. And when he said, I know my Redeemer lives, he says, I know the one who has a pen in his hand. I know the one who can drive this to the destination. I know I might not feel him right now, but I know he's still with me. I know he'll never leave me nor forsake me. My Redeemer lives. I heard the song say, I talked to him this morning. My Redeemer lives. I want to encourage you today. Your Redeemer, he lives. And last point, then you go home and get your Easter, uh, get your Easter brunch and take off your uncomfortable clothes. Here we go. <laughs> Psalm 119, verses 156 through 160. And I want to make sure you catch the eternal value of verse 160 when we get there. Verse 156 says, Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. Many are my persecutors and my enemies, yet I do not turn from your testimonies. I see the treacherous and I'm disgusted. Because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts and revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures how long? Forever. Uh huh. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. And so when I get to this moment, I begin to recognize in Psalm 150, 119, 156, he says, Great are your tender mercies. Mm -hmm. Great are your tender mercies. I, I just got to break it down to you because when I recognize Jesus resources and revives me, when I see this, he acknowledges the tender mercies of God and how undeserving we are. Great is abundance. Abundant. That's another way. Great, abundant, free flowing. They just keep on going. And then he says, your gives the divine attribute to the mercies. But then it says tender as well. So great, 
divine and tender. That's what he says. These are the mercies. And, and when I say tender, I'm not talking about T-I-N-D-E-R. I'm not saying swipe right, swipe left. I'm just saying look above. Uh, great. Abundant. Now, here's what I like about abundant mercy. Abundant mercy has all you need now and all you will ever need. Y'all got it? So this is why we would say his mercies are new every morning. <laughs> you might have woke up on the wrong side of the bed, but his mercies are on the right side of you. Come on. Yeah, his mercies are new every morning. Great are your mercies. Some seasons you go through that you might need mercy more than others. Y'all got to talk to me. You know, sometimes you're going through things and you say, look, God, I can't get right. You ever had that can't get right spirit? You can't talk right. You can't act right. You just can't get right. This is going to be my last time. And the last time was the first time of a new season. And that can't get right spirit. Get Y'all better talk to me. Y'all know the can't get right spirit. And then what he's saying is, but my mercies are new. So even when you can't get right, I can help you get right. That they're new, everyone. He don't even give you yesterday's mercies. It means that you come in in abundance. And so he says, this morning when you woke up, I'm going to give you Wednesday mercies on Wednesday. Thursday mercies on Thursday. Friday's Mercies on Fridays. They are new every morning. Somebody shout, they new. They not expired. They not left over. They are new. But then it says they're tender. I like this right here. This, these tender mercies, that means that they are personal. No, they, are pre they are precious and particular. Precious and particular. And when I think about tender mercies, uh, he knows how to deal with you in your weakness. This is why he became weak. That everything that Jesus did by suffering on the cross, he lived a life that we should have lived without sin. He became weak, yet he did not sin. And so he lived in the human weakness so that in our weakness, his strength could be made what? Oh, y'all, I thought y'all was Bible thumpers. His strength could be made what? Perfect. And so when I begin to get to this moment that the mercies are precious in particular, this means he knows exactly where my weak spots are. And he, and he applies it right there. You ever have an itch on your back? And if you built like me, you can't reach it. It's just right here. It's just right here. And if you ever had an itch on your back, I'm telling you, I'm finding door seals and everything. I'm like a bear, like blue. Right, and, and, and these are bare necessities. Y'all better talk to me. And, and but it's something when you got an itch on your back and you can't quite get there. But then you got a trusted individual that can scratch your back. Oh my gosh! They mess around, hit that right spot. Your leg starts shaking like a puppy. Thank you, right there. Oh, and then it starts moving. What I'm saying is, tender mercies. They are precious in particular. They know exactly where the itch is, and they know how to get there, and they know how to get you right. And that's what I'm saying is that in this, he says, "Great are your tender mercies." He knows exactly where you need it. But then, then he said this. Uh, he said, "Look." Um, Greater your tender mercies. And, and when I see this, this, this means he resources us with heaven's, with heaven's expenses. And he affords us what we cannot afford ourselves. Just the other day, me and my lovely bride, we was, we was walking. We was in the mall. It was out of town. And uh, you ever been in stores, you realize this store was made for people with different tax brackets? <laughs> yeah. I was one store. They had like a red carpet. And then it had somebody standing out in front of it with a suit, right, and a stanchion right there. I was like, I'm so broke, I can't even window shop here. I walked by this joint like it was the veil. <laughs> I just felt like if I walked by, they might just get my debit card and run it out. Just, there, you walk by, that's $5,500 right there. And so we was in the, we was in the mall, and, and we, we went up, got up the escalator in one of the stores. You know, the stores that got multiple escalators, the price just go up the higher you go. And we got up there, my wife, my lovely bride, I want to give her the world, right? But we, we, we realists too. And so we went up there, I knew she was looking for a certain color. And at this point, I knew what type of game it was, right? I said, babe, you like that? She was like, well, that's all right, that is the color though. And I, and I looked at it and I looked. Uh, I said, the feeling was right, but the price was wrong. I said, babe. I said, look at how much this costs. And it was four digits beyond, before the period. I mean, I would have thought, that with that type of price, it would have came with AC, a back scratcher. It would have came, it would have came with deodorant. Ladies, it would have came with Spanx. Y'all better talk to me. <laughs> Fellas, it would have came with a little shaper. Yep. 
Y'all be like, oh, he look good. He V-shaped. No, that thing tucked in. <laughs> Let me stop. Let me keep going. Y'all got me acting out. I'm trying to get out of here. So yeah. <laughs> right? And so she looks at it. This is, I love my wife. I love my wife. She, she hood influence. Hood, hood influence, if I could break black English vernacular down to you, is that you, you won't necessarily raise in the hood, but you got some hood tendencies. You hood adjacent, right? And you just, you kind of, so a certain vernacular and certain, so she looks at the price tag and she said, oh my gosh, she slapped my hand like, babe, take your hand. <laughs> she, she took it, she slapped my hand like, babe, we can't afford that. I said, shh. Don't be telling people what we can't afford. I'm, oh man, I buy what I want to. Y'all ever went in debt trying to prove that you can pay for something? <laughs> Buy what I want to. And so here's what I realized. I was like, man, I'm in a store and I'm shopping around, but I can't afford nothing. But when I go to the warehouse of my God and I look at stuff that I can't afford, he says, you don't have to afford it because I've already adorned you with it. That has already been paid for. I don't know if there's anybody in here that you can testify the joy you have. You can't afford it, but you still got it. The peace you have, you can't afford it, but you still got it. All the freedom you have, you can't afford it, but you still got it. I don't know if there's anybody in here that can testify. God, you've given me things I could never deserve. You've given me what I could never afford. I might not be able to buy it, but I got a Savior who paid it all. And in Him, I am free indeed. Somebody should shout God a praise for giving you what you cannot afford. He made a way out of no way. I still got it. As we, as we prepare to leave, you can stay on your feet. Hi, let me go back to where we started, this guaranteed delivery thing. When you go to Amazon and you click and then the order fulfillment team starts to work and then they tell you it'll be there in two days. They guarantee two-day delivery. As we came to this Resurrection Sunday, I couldn't help but think, what happens when we call on the name of the Lord? That when we call on the name of the Lord, that there's an order fulfillment team, grace and mercy, that begins to go to work in the warehouse. But due to the size of our order, it wasn't going to take two days. It was going to take three days. And due to the order of salvation, he knew that he had to go through some stuff before he can guarantee the delivery. And what I realized is Jesus, in order to fulfill our order of salvation, in order to fulfill our order of redemption, he had to become like us. And Jesus, he lived the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. Jesus, he came into our situation. He took on our filth so he could release his favor. He related with us. He redeems us. He rescues us. And on Good Friday, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we will be healed. So what did they do? They put a crown of thorns on his head. They put nails in his hands and nails in his feet. But he said that deliverance would be guaranteed instead of calling down a legion of angels. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Deliverance guaranteed. And they put him in a borrowed tomb. Day one, he took our penalty. Day two, he set the captives free. And day three, early one Sunday morning, early one Sunday morning, he rose with all power in his hands. And now his name has a guarantee. When you call on the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Is anybody here glad about it? That the tomb is empty. That the cross is empty. That Jesus got up. Can't nobody do you like Jesus. Come on, he'll reach way down and he'll pick you up. Somebody shout God a praise in here. He'll open doors that no man can close. He's your burden bearer. He's your living water. He's your living bread. And I'm excited to celebrate that deliverance is guaranteed. Come on, give God a praise in this place, family. Give God a praise in this place.
Come on, isn't he worthy? So as we're here today, we have celebrated, and hopefully this has inspired you, informed you, but also invited you. That you don't have to window shop this joy. You don't have to window shop this peace. Shipping and handling has already been covered. Jesus didn't die to make your life better just right now. He died that his word would be true in all of eternity. He says in his father's house, there are many mansions. And he's looking to fill those rooms today. On this Easter Sunday, will you deeply consider that you have requested Jesus to be your representative in heaven? When you get there, don't let, nobody else can represent you. Grandma can't represent you. Duck can't represent you. But Jesus can. He'll represent you. And if you call on his name, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Whoever. I don't know what you in, but here's what, I'm, here's what I'm confident in, that Jesus can cover it. And he doesn't just cover it so you can remain the same. He covers it so you no longer have to be in bondage to it. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we thank you for this day. And God, I pray now, Lord, that we will receive what it is you have for us. Lord, let none of us leave this place questioning who you are or what you can do for us. God, I pray today that those who are far away will be drawn near. Those who have fallen away, that they will come back. Those who are discouraged will be encouraged. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.